it was the final bout between the two aliens, Goku and Frieza. The two had always had bad blood between each other. Frieza was the one that destroyed his home planet, planet and killed off almost the entirety of his race as well after all. Despite their issues though, Goku made the mistake of giving Frieza a chance at changing his ways. Time and time again, he spared the albino lizard's life too many times to count over the years and despite all that, he would go back to his evil ways every single time. Each time either Goku or Vegeta would have to put him down but enough was enough. Goku was now 70 years old and beginning to decline in performance. Frieza, on the other hand, had no such such issues. Where you see, he had a far longer lifespan than that of a human or Saiyan. Frieza figured that with Goku's old age beginning to get the best of him now, it would allow for him to successfully kill the Saiyan once and for all. The biggest thorn thorn to his plans up until now you would finally be removed the fight would have been glorious yet destructive several planets would have been severely damaged throughout their fight the bloodshed would have been something Frieza reveled in well it would be if it weren't for Goku he didn't understand this saying. He was he was well past his prime, yet he was still going rather strong against the Space Emperor. Frieza had trained for a whole year prior to this fight, so why was it that this monkey could still keep up with him? Not only that, but as the uh, fight continued to progress, Frieza no noticed that he was beginning to be pushed back into a corner. Was the Saiyan really getting the edge over him? No, it couldn't be. Frieza refused to lose to an old monkey that was way past its glory days. Frieza understood that Goku still couldn't breathe in space so he would try to blow up the planet they were currently on just like the first time. The only difference here was that there were no pods to save this blasted Saiyan this time around. Frieza would grab Goku by the face and throw him to another planet one last time. Frieza would have flown over to the planet before Goku could land and throw down a large scale attack that would put well penetrate the planet's surface. It would rapidly reach the core of the planet and destroy it. The planet was beginning to erupt now. Frieza would have had glee on his face. Goku would have arrived too late to stop Frieza. When he reached the planet, planet's atmosphere, he had to maneuver himself in a way that wouldn't cause him to crash the ground on his back. He'd managed to land on his feet and see the aftermath of Frieza's last attack. He understood, it. He understood exactly what Frieza was trying to do. He would roar at Frieza, demanding why the space lizard was so persistent in trying to bring destruction to the universe. Frieza wouldn't dignify the same with a response though. Instead he tried to send a death beam at Goku which wouldn't even penetrate his skin. Goku had had enough of Frieza now. He couldn't hold back anymore. Even though this swarm had a terrible backlash comparable to the first time he used Ultra Instinct, it was the only form strong enough to permanently put down Frieza. Goku would power up into his purging beyond junctures, put the acronyms together, form which involved his aura and hair becoming brown. He also grew hair similar to that of when he was younger and still had his tail. Essentially whatever happened whenever he looked at the full moon and he would turn into a Nazaru back when he was a kid. Now Frieza's eyes they would widen seeing this. 
His body began to unconsciously tremble at the aura Goku was exuding. It was beyond what he had even thought cap capable of from the Saiyan or anyone for that matter. Before he could even utter any words, he would find a hole through his chest. Goku would get out to the form right after and collapse to the ground, paralyzed. The planet they were on would blow up only one minute later. The two arch enemies, they would have died that day. This wouldn't be the end for their souls though. You see, the Dragon Balls had been banned by Beerus a couple of years back after he noticed a pattern of the, of the Z fighters, using them to bring back people from the dead, which meant it would be impossible to revive Goku, but the Saiyan would have been happy in the afterlife. As for Frieza, <laughs> he was actually meant, meant to go back down to HFIL, you know, home for infinite losers, but Yama decided to do something different here. Ever since the success of reincarnating Kid Buu, Yama figured that it would be good to try maybe, I don't know, redeeming the evil souls by reincarnating them as well, but in different universes. They'd have a different life and different opportunities. They could contribute. They could contribute to society for once. He had to go through a ton of paperwork with the other afterlifes for each universe, of course, throughout the years. But he would eventually get the project the project greenlit. He'd wish the best for the space tyrant, but the poor ogre would only accomplish one thing in this project, and that would be getting Frieza's existence out of his hair. The next universe would have no idea what they were in store for. Frieza's soul would have been placed into that of a baby boy. That boy's name was Issei Hiodo. From a young age, Issei would have understood that he was better than the rest of the kids around his age. You see, he was smarter, but also stronger, far stronger actually, by the time he was only 4 years old, his strength was comparable to that of a teenager, and even then, Issei had a feeling he was lowballing his true strength. He didn't know the upper limits, but he wasn't particularly interested in finding out. He was more interested in money actually. Sure, he wasn't, he wasn't particularly poor growing up, but he had an obsession overruling over other people. He admired the world's richest people because they had several thousands working underneath them. For every accomplishment made by an employee, he would simply remain nameless while the head of the company got all the credit in the public eye. <laughs> He wanted to stand right next to these sort of people because of that. He didn't like to put too much effort in his work, but he supposed he would have to start from somewhere though. Issei would have only been 7 years old when he started uh, wreaking havoc around his school. Some kids tried making fun of his pale skin, and they would even call him a vampire, laughing at him. Issei would have been annoyed though by their insults. And he would decide to teach them a lesson of sorts. You see, he would make sure the whole school saw what he was about to do. He would easily dispatch all the quote unquote bullies, but he supposed he used a little too much strength in that fight. You see, these kids were only two or three years older than him, so they couldn't really take that much of a punch. He landed the boys in the ER when he was done beating them up. They had to be treated for broken arms, rims, and one even had a fractured skull. Issei would have been sent to Juby for about two years, but even there, Issei would still be plotting his next action. He realized it wouldn't be all that ideal for him to get his hands dirty. It would be better for other kids to do it in his place. Create a gang, essentially. He'd get into a couple of altercations while in juvie, but he'd easily put each and every kid down. He was obviously holding back against these mongrels, but he figured he could use them now that they had a newfound fear for the Hyodo child. They would be the first couple of people to join his gang. 
the boy and a couple others would be released from juvie and start back up school but Issei cared very little for most of his subjects except for math. Even then the only reason he was interested in that subject was because he'd imagined counting money very often. Learning multiplication and division could be useful in the future when his market value went up. Multiplication could help him calculate the prices for whatever he planned on selling in the future to make the most profit. Subtraction and division would be useful in helping him cut his losses. That was pretty much all he was interested in learning from school. Marketing skills would be something Issei valued the most, but that wasn't something he would be learning at school. YouTube wasn't all that much help either. Honestly, they just used a bunch of big words to seem smart, but the people in the videos were saying a bunch of nothing. He'd only gained those skills with experience, and that experience would come from him running this small gang of his. It wouldn't take long for the groom to grow though with Issei's strength. Issei didn't really know what to call his gang at first, but a name would eventually pop up in his head. He'd call the group the Frost Demons and even come up with a purple and white logo that they'd wear on the back of their sh shirts or jackets. Most of Issei's business would involve his group extorting the children around his school. They only had chump change though, most of the time his gang was just stealing kids lunch money. Sure, stealing $5 from 30 kids each would be a considerably large amount of money for someone of Issei's age, but he had big dreams. He wanted to go further. The only way he could do that though was by expanding his gang. He'd supply his men with weapons he'd find around the neighborhood and keep a knife for himself. He didn't really need a knife necessarily, but he figured it would be better to keep a weapon of some sort on him when all of when all of his men had won, rather than, rather than being the only person to walk around empty handed. He'd supply his soldiers with a mission of recruiting more members to join the Frost Demons. If they had any issues, well, Issei would just personally visit those who refused to join his group and persuade them himself. By the time he was 12 years old, his group would have grown by a large degree. <laughs> he started off with around 5 or 6 members, but it, it had grown to become 80-ish now. He wasn't sure of the exact number, but it was probably around that number range. And his group was growing day by day now. His group had managed to start extorting money from some adults now. Small businesses would have to start paying Issei's group as they were selling products on their turf. In order to be protected from vandalism, the businesses had to give the Frost Demons 20% of their profit for the month. Although some refused and would even call the police, they would quickly learn that that was a fruitless effort. Uh, Issei he was built different, you see, he was too strong and fast for the police. Sure, some of his guys got arrested, but they were usually newbies or weak links. They weren't much of a loss whatsoever. The small businesses would try to get rid of Issei's gang, but they could never truly get rid of them. As long as Issei was around, they would only continue to flourish, and the stubborn small businesses would decimate. Issei was practically about the law with how strong he was. He was too fast to even get touched by bullets, and even for the few that managed to get a lucky shot on Issei, they didn't even pierce his skin. He'd even show the police a couple of times just how durable he was by standing still and letting the bullets bounce off of him. He'd smoke and pummel them to the ground right after. A couple of people would record it in their videos, they would go viral. This would only further boost the infamy of Issei's group. Several kids would find Issei to be cool for being able to stand up to the police in such a way. He was like a superhero or a villain depending on who you asked in real life. 
his gang was also making a ton of money. It honestly sounded really enticing to many kids. Issa's group would grow from what now seems like a measly 80 to 800 all in one year. The small businesses would have no choice but to bend to Issei's will in the end since the police couldn't do anything to the frost demons. Issei was too much of a monster to handle. Issei's territory would also continue to grow with the more people that joined this gang. Issei barely had to lift a finger at this point and he was generating an easy 5.5 million yen a month after distributing the money among his members. Issei's parents wouldn't have been well aware of what Issei had been getting up to in the past couple of years but there really wasn't much they could possibly do to him. If the boy was fast enough to outpace speeding bullets and durable enough to have them bounce off of them as well, what could they honestly do? Punish him? With what? Taking away a CV? <laughs> Giving him a spanking? <laughs> Y yeah right, they saw what Issei did to his subordinates whenever they got out of line and they went in the mood for getting beaten to an inch of their lives. It wasn't like Issei even needed them in his life anymore either. He was making more money than them for crying out loud. Even if he wasn't, it wouldn't really matter in the long run. He could probably just break into a couple of stores and steal their food after all. The people wouldn't be able to do anything either considering how Issei in one video was shown lifting a police car and with minimal, with minimal effort. For the record, that was an armored police truck I should say, I should clarify, and that was with minimal effort. Three years would pass and Issei's gang basically controlled a third of Japan at this point. Issei's gang was full of people ranging from all ages. Among them were people who were probably old enough to be Issei's father, all the way down to those who were just learning to tie their shoes. The main reason people so small were part of the frost demons now was just because of their parents being part of the gang as well. The amount of money you could make being part of the frost demons was comparable to an average job at this point but without taking out the taxes. The government couldn't really do much to them either. Well, I shouldn't say that. You see, they could arrest some gang members, yeah, but what good would that do when they couldn't get their boss? The guy who was known for eating eating bullets at the age of 12. The guy who was lifting armored trucks for his daily workout. He took down a SWAT team once for goodness sake. The frost demons were more than just a gang now. It was a whole criminal empire with members making shady deals with small businesses on the daily. All sorts of properties would end up being bought up by the small businesses that could afford Issei's fee to join forces with him. Those who couldn't keep up with Issei's expenses seemed, well, simply just drowned and that was that. Issei would have a second in command at this point. His name was Sanji and he proved to be more capable, capable than the rest of his soldiers. He was impressive enough to catch Issei's attention, especially with the amount of profit he made for Issei. He wanted to keep this boy close to him. He seemed to have a smart enough mind to understand the value of money and how to make more of it without having to work a 9 to 5 job. From the way Sanji talked as well about possible ways to improve Issei's empire, he would understand that this boy was very special. Almost as special as Issei, intellectually speaking, in terms of strength, <laughs> yeah, he still didn't hold a candle to Issei. This was what made Saji Issei's second in command. He paid the boy handsomely as well to make sure he always stayed by his side. During, during one of their conversations one day though, Saji would bring up some random all-girls school by the name of Kubo Academy. Apparently, Sanji wanted to go there since he saw how cute the girls there were. 
Issei would just laugh at how shallow of a reason Sanji had to want to go to some school, especially considering how they basically dropped down a while ago. Issei dropped down at 13 to focus more on his ever expanding gang, while Sanji dropped down at 14 to devote his time in climbing the social ladder of the frost demons, which he didn't regret whatsoever. Issei would do Sanji a favor though and find out about the superintendent. From there, Issei would have a couple of his men have a talk with a man about the possibility of opening up cool academy to both genders. Needless to say, his men were very, very convincing. So convincing, as a matter of fact, that the superintendent would make an announcement about how Cool Academy would be open to both genders starting next year. Now all Issei had to, now all Issei really had to do was, well, wait. As soon as the school, as soon as the school year opened up, Issei and Sanji would be some of the first boys to enter the premises. Several of Issei's gang members who were around the age of high school students would actually follow right behind the boy. A fraction of Issei's men was enough to drastically shift the gender ratio at the school. What probably would have been a ratio of 6 girls to 1 boy would now be 2 girls for every 5 boys. Issei would stand out amongst the students the most though. While everyone else, including the gang members, surprisingly, had the decency to wear the cool academy uniform, Issei d just decided to wear an all white suit and a pair of purple tinted brown sunglasses. The girls wouldn't have minded the idea of guys joining the school, but what they did mind though was the fact that gangsters were joining their school. They acted like they owned the place and it didn't help with the fact that they were partially right in believing this considering how their leader was in the school as well. They were still questioning whether Issei actually registered to go to this school or if he just decided to come here just because he could. This was a question everyone had to be honest. Even Sanji asked Issei this question before but the pale leader of the frost demons just laughed, not actually answering his friend's question. Despite the infamy that surrounded Issei's name, one girl would decide to stand her ground against a boy. The girl's name was Sona Citri. Excuse me, but would you care to actually treat this school with some respect? Sona asked sternly. Issei would be confused as to who she was referring to at first until she called out his name. Oh, you're talking to me. Yes, who else could I be talking to? You're the leader of this gang after all, or is that false and there's someone pulling the strings from behind the scenes? Several of the girls would gasp hearing these words come out of Sona. Issei's men were beginning to sweat nervously as well. Not for Issei's sake of course, but for their own. They'd seen what Issei was capable of when he was facing off against the police, which was exactly why they didn't want to deal with an angry Issei. He could easily go rampant and pull them all sick well not pull them, but put them all six feet under, they were practically ready to flee at any moment if Issei snapped. I'd watch my tone if I were you, Issei would state. Or what? Sona questioned further. The gangsters went pale. This girl had a death wish for the whole school. She must have. What did these girls at the school do to her for her to act this way? She was literally about to get them all killed. Rule 165 states that 
All members of the Frost Demons are permitted to carry weapons of all kinds on campus so long as they are concealed while not in use. Rule 166 states that all members of the Frost Demons have demons have full permission to use their weapons whenever someone steps out of line so long as they don't kill them. Yep. Issei would proceed to pull out the latest edition of the school handbook. Skip to page 97. Issei would hand Sona the book and she would skip precisely, precisely to the said page where it stated that Issei's gang had full permission to do as they pleased with their weapons. Rule 100, 164 even said that it didn't matter if the Frost Demons had a license for any of their weapons or not. Now, I'm willing to forgive this major amount of disrespect if you get on your hands and knees and work like a dog for me. Sona would refuse to do such a demeaning act. Issei would shrug and snap his fingers in the air once to signal for his men to pull out their, we their weapons which ranged from wooden ham- wooden ham- wooden bats to hammers. They would have carried some firearms as well but Issei, Issei made a call on that, on that little one being well overkill. This was where outside the school premises. Sanji wouldn't be carrying a knife though when Issei decided to go empty handed. There really wasn't much of a point in carrying a weapon on his person at this point when considering how strong he was and even now Issei still hadn't reached an actual cap to his strength. In all honesty, even now Issei was restraining himself. He was being generous enough in allowing this, allowing this girl to go out so lightly by being beaten up by his gang when she disrespected him to such a degree. Rightfully, he should have just broken her spine, but this would be fine as well. It would be 7 minutes worth of Sona ruthlessly gang gang getting ganged up on by Issei's men. Issei would eventually get bored and snap his fingers once, once more signaling for his men to leave their girl alone. Most of her bones were shattered and she was bleeding from her temple area. Sona couldn't believe how easily she had been dealt with. She read if she used her magic even once it would have been a different story, but she knew better. She was supposed to be stronger than the average human even if they had a weapon, but apparently her durability only went so far when there were like a hundred guys at a time stomping her out. She would fall unconscious not, not a minute later though from the pain. She needed immediate medical attention. Ice wasn't going to cover it anymore. <laughs> Some of the girls would call 119, the Japanese number for the fire department and ambulance. Others would just stare, frozen in shock and fear. Issei would simply walk over Sona's battered body, followed by the rest of his gang. The girls would make a path for Issei, not wanting to get in his way and end up in the same position as Sona. The path would be the path would be closed up after the last member left. Five minutes later, an ambulance would arrive at the school for Sona. A girl with crimson red hair would bite through the crowd to see what all the commotion was for and she would gasp, seeing Sona's condition. She'd get close to her friends and rival, demanding to know who did this to her. Sona would be unresponsive though, and the medical team would force Rias back. Rias would ask around and find out it was because of one of the new kids, Issei Hiyodo, that Sona ended up in such a position. Rias now wanted to know where she could find him. She wanted to give the boy a piece of her mind. She'd heard the rumors regarding how strong Issei was, but from everything she had seen from, from, from the boy, he just seemed to be a big fish in a small pond. Sure, he was unusually strong for a human, but she felt like she could handle him in a fight 1v1. If she had to, she'd even be willing to 
use her, use her magic against him as well. But she found that to be overkill. Apparently, Issei had an office made by the school, which really wasn't all that surprising to the girl considering the amount of inf influence Issei managed to garner in only a couple of years. This was where he was apparently going to be hang hanging out a lot from now on, and it was guarded by several men outside. They'd block entry, mentioning how she had to make an appointment with their boss if she wished to talk to him in his office. He was a busy man after all. Rias found this to be rather ridiculous though. She used a small amount of her magic to knock out his men and budge in unannounced. Issei would raise an eye in curiosity at such an act from what looked like an average schoolgirl in, in terms of physicality. She didn't appear to have a whole lot of muscle whatsoever in, compar in comparison to Issei. Although Issei's muscle came mainly from a lot of calisthenics and lifting giant cars, it wasn't like he was purposefully trying to build muscle like all those meatheads who went to the gym on a daily, on a daily basis to either help their self-confidence or for women. What do you want? Rias would be fuming right now. She would go on on a tirade actually about how Issei was a horrible person and how he should feel ashamed of what he did to Sona, but a whole lot of her wounds were just going in one ear and out the other. It just sounded like she was a chihuahua, yapping, never knowing when to shut up. <laughs> he hated chihuahuas for that very reason. Issei would eventually have enough and interrupt Issei. Are we missing? Interrupt Rias. <laughs> nobody, nobody interrupts Issei. Look, I don't care who you are and what your issues with me may be. A lot of people have issues with me, but they can't do anything about it. Now, if your goal was to waste my valuable time, when I could have been looking over some paperwork or counting money, money to be distributed among my top men, you've surely done a tremendous job at that. <laughs> yeah, so soldiers, get this orangutan out of my office immediately. A second set of soldiers would step over their unconscious ones and grab Rias, dragging her by the feet out of the brown haired boy's office. She would scream the whole time she was being forced out of Issei's office. Many students would simply stare at the scene Rias was making in silence. Issei's reign over Kuo Academy had only just begun. His reign was relatively peaceful though. He reigned in fear, sure, but he didn't go out of his way to cause chaos. Those that tried to question his authority would simply be made into examples by his men. He also had a weekly tax for the kids as well, but it wasn't too excessive, just, I don't know, 700 yen. Naturally, his men were exempted from the taxes though. Some actually were the ones to collect the taxes from the students. It wasn't like Issei really needed the money from these kids or anything. But in Issei's mind, there was nothing wrong with making more money no matter where it came from. With the way Issei's gang operated, some of the students would actually be tempted to join Issei's cause. Out to the few who joined though, there were one ex- well, there was just one exceptional female who stood out above the rest. Her name was Yuma and she had long raven black hair. Issei noticed how she operated and it reminded him of Sanji somewhat with how ruthless she could be when it came to making sure they got their money. No business was spared if they tried to give the frost demons a smaller amount of money than what they had agreed upon. 
Isay was a junior high dropout, but that didn't mean he was redundant. In his free time, actually, Isay learned how to read and calculate stocks. He also had the businesses. He made ties with constantly sending reports of their weekly output. The deal with allying with Isay's group was that the businesses had to give them 20% of their monthly monthly profit. That was the base amount though, depending on how much resources they needed to borrow from Isay, it could go all the way up to 30 or even 40 percent. Some businesses had some businesses had issues with this and would try to send in false reports to Isay with lower numbers than they were actually making. These businesses would then be able to get away with sending a smaller percentage overall, well at least that's what they thought. Issei would be able to tell whether or not a business was actually struggling from their stock value. If they were making less money then it would show in their stocks but they were still going up. <laughs> These businesses Issei would make sure got several pun- well not several got severely punished for their betrayal. This Yuma girl was the main person that Issei would hear about getting the job done extraordinarily well. Though some businesses would still try to embezzle money from Issei despite getting some of their stores, stores burned down by his gang, this Yuma girl managed to get these businesses to consistently pay the full amount of what they agreed upon. Sometimes she would even bring in even more, which actually impressed Issei quite a bit. She rose in the ranks fast with her ruthless nature. The businesses feared this girl. Sure, they feared Issei as well, but newer businesses saw Issei as more of a legend of sorts, they knew of him, but never actually met the man, they'd only seen his displays of violence over the screen and therefore had less fear overall for him. It was different with Yuma though, she was practically a physical manifestation of their worst fears with how she broke some of their employees' bones, trashed their stores, and left the business owners beaten to an inch of their life if they ever tried to be slick with their monthly monthly payments. The fact she looked like your average high schooler was even more terrifying since most people let their guards down around her only to be left crippled when they slipped up. It only took a year for the girl to gain Issei's respect and become his third in command. Sanji was still Issei's second in command considering how long he had been with Issei for and how much he had helped with furthering the progression of his empire. Sanji was the brains of Issei's operation while Yuma was the brawn. Issei was none the wiser about the girl's true nature though. Though. <laughs> Yuma was just the first of a whole new world that he was about to be introduced to. Issei wouldn't know much more about the existence of other races in the world until he was walking home one night and had an encounter with a man wearing a trench coat. He mentioned some person by the name of Rainier and how he didn't understand why he was letting well, why she was letting Issei live for so long when they really should have ended his life a long time ago. Issei wouldn't even bat an eye at that statement. A lot of people wanted to kill him. None were strong enough though. He figured out it was just another victim of Issei's gang violence trying to get revenge or whatever. What did shock Issei though was when the guy pulled out a bit well, a pair of black wings and began to soar into the, into the sky with a light spear, ready to charge at Issei. Issei was, well, far faster than Donna Seek though, so that was, wasn't really much of an issue when it came on to combat. Issei was, with a shadow of a doubt, way beyond Donna Seek's league when it came on to strength as well. 
Issei outclassed Dynasty you can all stand, but Issei would be lying if he said he wasn't curious as to what exactly this guy was. There was a possibility that there were more anomalies in this world like Issei, but with less exposure than him. He'd be done and seek to an inch of his life while questioning the man on what exactly he was. He'd find out that they were apparently a fallen angel and sent here by a higher order to kill Issei. From that statement alone, Issei would imply that there were more like Donisik out there. They weren't human, but an entirely different race in and of itself. This intrigued Issei. He wondered if he could meet more like this guy, Donisik, and if they were stronger as well considering how he had powers. Did they have a government that was similar to Japan? Or did they go based off of strength and merits like Issei's criminal empire? Issei's thought process would be broken though when he heard the weak pleading of Donisik to just finish him now. He didn't want to endure the pain any longer than he had to. Issei would shrug and oblige but if he was going to kill the guy, he wanted to at least get a trophy from such a rare occasion. He never met a creature like Donisik before after all. He'd grab his two wings and put his foot on Donisik's back. The man would have had his face on the pavement aching from the excruciating pain that Issei had just put him through, but none of it would compare to what Issei was about to do. As Issei pulled on the man's wings, Donisik screamed in agony as this was a whole new sort of pain he wasn't used to. His wings were literally getting ripped off of him, and while he was conscious, it was too much for Donisik at this point. His heart would go out and he would go silent when Issei finished ripping off his wings. Issei would take a moment to admire the wings before going home with them. He'd leave the body in the street so someone else could figure out what to do with them in the morning. It wasn't his problem after all. The next day, as Issei expected, there were reports of a deceased body found on the streets. It looked like it looked like someone carved into their back and their face was beyond the point of any sort of recognition with how battered it was. Issei would have been eating a cereal while listening to the news. He'd smake, imagining the reactions of the many people living around that part of the neighborhood, wondering if this was a sign. A sign that there was a murderer of some sorts on what was supposed to be a relatively peaceful neighborhood even with Issei's gang around. If these people became fearful enough, Issei could potentially profit off of that by creating a form of protection for these people. He could have some of his men patrol the area during the night so long as they were paid weekly by the civilians living in the area. They could even go a bit further and turn some of them into bodyguards if they wanted that extra protection. And it would be for a more affordable price than the standard bodyguards. His imagination might have gone a bit off the deep end there, but at the rate things were going, in a couple of months it would probably be within the realm of possibility. There were, well, there was also this whole thing with the bird guy last night, so much, so pretty much nothing was off the table at this point. <laughs> Once Issei was done with the cereal, he would head over to school, but he would actually be parading the pair of wings he ripped off of a seat last night. This was Issei's trophy after all. Many people would be looking on in confusion when seeing the pitch black wings though. And anatomically speaking, these wings so made no sense. Some people believed that they were fake wings, but the rotting smell and dripping blood said something else. Sanji would look on in curiosity while Rainer had a look of shock in her eyes. She sent, she sent Donisik to test out Issei's strength and figure out whether he was just a big fish in a small pond or not. She didn't believe Issei was all that strong at first, but those detached wings spoke a different story. She had to report this to the higher-ups immediately. 
She wasn't about to get directly involved just yet though. She wanted to keep keep observing Ethan whether or not he had unlocked his sacred sacred gear yet. Well, he had to if he was exuding this much strength, right? It was probably just one of those sacred gear that then physically manifest into a weapon like a gauntlet or sword or whatever. But that was, was simply just connected to his soul. She wasn't completely sure though. Once again, Issei seemed to be a very odd figure, but she liked the way he took command. It was alluring to her, but she couldn't afford to have her own mission. Well, not mission, but her own emotions for the boy affect and possibly jeopardize her mission. She was probably going to need to bring in backup to observe Issei. She had a feeling that she was going to become like Icarus if she tried getting too close to Issei without someone to reel her back. The next day, Rainier would introduce her friends, Kala Warner and Mattel. She'd explain to Issei that the two were interested in joining his gang. They understood that they had to prove their worth and they would do so by any means necessary. Issei liked that sort of attitude so he would give, give them a couple of trial missions. One of these missions would involve them silencing the occult research club. The girls would be would be accompanied by some of his senior gangsters but they would be observing more than really helping. Kyle Warner and Mattel would understand an ambush reassess group one day after their constant complaints about Issei's tirade around the school. They would take down the members one by one rather than fight them as a whole group. It was easier that way. Kyle Warner and Mattel would leave Kiba in a critically injured state. Konako would have been tough due to her more durable nature, but they'd eventually leave her unconscious by secretly using some of their magic against her. Akino they would attack with a pair of metal bats immediately knocking her out. They would beat down on her unconscious body a couple of times before getting bored. Rias would be pushed down the stairs and stomped down by the two fallen angels until she fell unconscious. As far as Rias' group, group was concerned, uh, a couple of people from Issei's gang just decided to attack them one day and they didn't even seem to be all that strong either, but yet they were taken down like ants. Rias would be bitter about the whole thing, even though those guys snuck up on their peerage they shouldn't have been defeated so easily. They needed to get stronger if they ever wanted to get revenge. They needed to heal as fast as possible though. As soon as that thought came, came to mind, a magical portal would open up in the hospital for the room Rias was staying in. Her frown would only deepen when seeing the spoiled brat of the Phoenix family, Riser Phoenix, show up. He was supposed to be her fiance, but Rias had no intention of marrying him. She was trying to find every way to get out of that marriage, but everything fell through each time. She was all out of options now. To be beaten up by some average gangsters was practically a disgrace to all devils. Rias felt defeated when, when Riser walked up to her bedside. He looked at her wounds and questioned who would dare do such a thing to his beautiful, beloved wife-to-be. Rias would be tight-lipped at first, but decided to use Riser's concern to her advantage at this moment. If she couldn't beat Issei by herself, then maybe she could use Riser. Rias would go on to talk affection affectionately to Ryzen, mentioning how there was this big old bad guy at her school that liked to pick on her and her friends. He beat up Sona and went on to have her cell phone appearance get jumped by his gang. She was wondering if 
Leon all rise they could have a little talk with a pale skinned boy that was Issei. Rise would be livid hearing this and he would request an image of the boy. Rias would simply describe Issei to Riser and the blonde would be on his way. <laughs> what a sim. Riser would create a magical portal and teleport to Kuo Academy. He'd be looking around for kids that fit the description Rias gave him. He'd hear some kids talk about the boy Issei and barge into their conversation, requesting for directions. He wanted to have a meeting with the boy. The kids would lead him to the Frost Demon Leader, the Frost Demon's Leader's office. But the door was blocked by his guards. Riser would laugh and, knock the, and immediately just knock out the guards. He was only interested in Issei. Nobody else. He'd bunch into the office room asking for an Issei Hyodo. Issei would look up from his papers with an eyebrow raised. He would raise his hand mentioning how the blonde was looking directly at him. Not a moment later, Riser would rush in and grab Issei's collar, lifting him up from out of his chair. Riser has recently heard that you've been messing with Riser's Rias. Riser doesn't appreciate. Riser would immediately be socked in the jaw by Issei. His jaw would be dislodged, dislodged, dislodged for a second, but it would heal right after. Issei wouldn't notice at first, though. Riser, on the other hand, would be in a state of surprise and slight fear. That punch hurt. Issei was merely a human though, the fact he could even injure Riser to begin with was a feat of strength in and of itself. Issei would brush himself off and smooth out his outfit. When he was done, he'd glare daggers at, at Riser. I don't care about your relation to that walrus of a woman. She's a nuisance and nuisances need to be dealt with before, before they grow out of control. Now if I were you, I'd leave right now. I know you're trying to look strong and all to impress her, but it would be better to run with your tail between your legs and live to see another day. You already put me in a bad mood by crumpling up my outfit though, so this is me being as nice as possible right now. Ryze's arrogance would get the best of him here though. He would believe that you say somebody got a lucky shot on him the first time around and that was just his adrenaline running while Riser had his guard down. It wasn't going to happen again. He'd send a fireball at Issei, surprising the boy, but he would just dodge rather easily still. He'd stomp out the flame before it began to spread and charge toward Riser. Issei would punch him directly in the face, rattling Riser's brain a little breaking his nose, a couple of teeth, and his skull was fractured a little as well. All of it would heal though. Easy, easy would then break Riser's arm as well and dislocate his shoulder, but at this point Issei would finally notice that something was up. Right after he broke Riser's arm, he began using it like nothing happened. That was highly unusual. He'd break Riser's legs, but He'd stand on his two feet right after, with not even a limp or wince of pain. Was Riser like that black wings guy he fought the other day? Just with different powers? He was intrigued now. This fight of theirs would continue for a while, but Issei would be holding back the whole time, simply toying with the man. Eventually, Issei would just get bored of dealing with this repetitive game and just decide to knock Riser out. He could have killed him right here and there, well, right there and then, but he wanted to learn more about this man's strange biology, what made him tick, why could he heal so fast, what was his connection to Rias Gremory and that crow he fought? Were they part of the same species? Or were there different species out there 
similar in appearance to humans besides, well, Donisek zone. Issei would get his questions answered in due time. He would make sure of it this time around. For the next couple of months, Issei would abuse the regeneration ability Riser had, turning the man into nothing more than his plaything essentially. He would be fed the bare minimum for a person to live and Issei would question him about many things. His first question was, what exactly was Riser? He refused to answer though and tried to get free from his restraints. But Issei would simply pound him to the ground, knowing that he would heal right after. Every time Riser refused to answer one of Issei's questions, he would suffer a beating from the boy. Riser would have been stubborn at first, getting beaten relentless, relentlessly every day. But after a month passed, he began to change his tune. His mind was beginning to break from the constant abuse. Even when he did answer, the most Riser got was a less severe beating from Issei. It was a never ending cycle of torture. The healing flames that Riser had prided, him, prided himself on for so long now had actually become more of a curse than a blessing. He wanted the suffering to end, but the flames prevented that from happening. After the fourth month of captivity, Riser would just be a shell of his former self. He was even starting to see hallucinations. Any thought of escaping had just disappeared. He was utterly defeated. At this point, he was just waiting for his next dosage of torture every day. Something surprised Riser though. There were more people with Issei today. Although at first he thought these people were hallucinations, until he noticed that Issei started taking breaks with them. One was wearing some Chinese attire mixed in with a school uniform, another seemed to be wearing spectacles and dressed like a sorcerer of sorts. The last was what looked like a little girl with blonde hair dressed up as some sort of magical girl. So, you mentioned how I'm only touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of potential. Can you elaborate on that? Of, co uh, uh, of course! See, this man right there is a devil. And as you've mentioned before, he has strange healing properties. That's probably because of his bloodline. The fact you could subdue him is impressive in and of itself. But what would be even more impressive is if you could be, well, bypass his healing and kill him. And how would I do that? Issei asked. Simple. Like this. The one wearing Chinese, Chinese attire would aim his spear at Riser and a beam, of, a beam of light would shoot out of it, completely vaporizing the Phoenix Clansman. Issei would be lying would be lying if he said he wasn't impressed, but he was also a bit unnerved. The fact this guy could do that so easily made him question just how strong he was. He refused to believe that Cao Cao could ri rival him in terms of strength. You see, we call weapons like the one I'm wielding right now sacred gears and you, sir, have one as well, but it, it appears you have yet to awaken it. I wonder why, though. Looking at how strong you are already, I must admit I am impressed. You'd be quite the scary fellow if you awakened your gear, and we can help you accomplish that. By joining the hero faction, we could even teach you how to use magic. The sorcerer would stretch out his hand using some lightning magic to convey South South's point. Issei would be slightly tempted, but he wasn't about, about to bow his head to anyone. If anything, they would be the ones bowing their heads to him. Alright. I'll join your little ragtag group, but 
on one condition. And what may that be? South Sal questioned. I'm the team leader, denied. South Sal quickly responded. Hmm. Oh well, guess I'm not joining your team then. It's as simple as that. South Sal's blood began to boil out Issei's response. How dumb could this guy be? He was about to waste the opportunity of a lifetime just because he couldn't be their leader? He didn't even know that Three other people working underneath him were fallen angels for goodness sake. Right when Sal was about to call out Issei's idiocy, the boy would surprise him with something. Issei was trying to mimic what the sorcerer boy just did, generating electricity in his hands. But while focusing his energy into his own hands, Issei would find that he was generating a purple ball of energy instead. He'd smoke seeing this. He could get used to this. Maybe even incorporate this into his fighting style so he didn't have to get his hands dirty anymore. Well, any more dirty than they already got. Well, nowadays, considering how his men were would, would usually the ones to handle most of the fights. Sal could practically sense the mass amount of power behind the ball of energy, and the frightening part about all of it was that Issei was a novice at this. Most weren't able to create something so powerful on their first try. <laughs> you see, well, now the question that Sal had on his mind was, was this guy even really human? Issei would offer a proposition to the other two Euro faction members who were in the same area as him. They could ditch Sao and be led underneath himself. Someone who already ran a gang by working underneath Issei, the group could potentially spread their ideals to every continent, continent in the world, and theoretically more. The two would stay silent, unfortunately, not even dignifying Issei with a response. Issei realized he would have to prove himself to the others if he wished to convince them to join his cause. He was fine with that, he supposed. He would just have to defeat Sao in a battle. Alright, Sao Sao. I have a proposition for you. Let's fight. If you win, I'll join the hero faction as one of your underlings with no complaints. If I win, you and the rest of the hero faction become my underlings moving forward, obeying my every command. Sounds like a deal? Sal Sal would be hesitant, but against this very judgment he would agree. He doubted that he would lose though, but on the off chance things didn't go in his favor, they could probably just brainwash Issei and have him forcefully join his team. The group would go to an open area with no signs of life for miles. This was meant to avoid potential unnecessary casualties. The whole point of the hero faction was to show that humans were superior to all other races, races such as devils and fallen angels, even angels and well, like the gods of different mythologies, killing some of their own people while having a simple squabble would be counterintuitive. Lefay was effectively the referee here, watching the fight and making sure it was a clean fight at that. The two boys would duke it out with Issei, being surprised by Sal Sal's strength and vice versa. Sal was the first person to push Issei to his limits in a fight and even attempt to create new attacks on the spot. These new attacks were mainly energy based though. He didn't have a name for them just yet, but he seemed to favor this one piercing attack he could shoot from just one finger. They would pierce through Sal's hand, shoulder, and knee, but the man would just keep pushing. Sal would be unnerved at the fact that throughout, the, throughout this whole fight, Issei still had yet to even unlock his sacred gear. Despite that, he was proven to be a close match for Sao, neither one of them was really gaining an edge over the other, and it would last for hours. Eventually, the two would collapse from P 
pure exhaustion, Saul would simply stare at his spear and wonder why the fight went the way it did. He thought for sure he would have had this in a bag due to Issei seemingly only having the skill of a street fighter, while Sao was far more skilled in terms of combat, and even wielded the weapon that pierced the biblical lord. It didn't seem to mean much of anything when facing Issei's raw strength, which he still didn't understand the origins of. Was he a hybrid or anything? He wasn't sure. The Fae wouldn't would actually inform the two that it was a tie which left both of them disgruntled. At first they wanted to have a rematch to see if either of them would come out the victor this time around but the Fae would, su would suggest another option, that being to split the hero faction in two. Those who wished to follow Issei would be more than welcome to do so and those who wanted to stay with Cao Cao, well, they would face no repercussions either. The two would begrudgingly agree, realizing that fighting between each other wasn't going to get them anywhere. The news would be would be spread to the rest of the hero faction about their new co-leaders of sorts. That of course being Issei. Many would want to stay with Sao at first, not really knowing anything about Issei except for a couple who heard that he hadn't even used his saber gear while fighting Sao. They had magic strength and would want to be would want to be with the strongest of the strong. They would notice that Issei was lacking in terms of knowledge of the other realms so, though and magic so those would be a couple of things that Issei would be taught. The group would also inform Sanji of the fact he also had a sacred gear and they would do their best to help him awaken it. They didn't really need to awaken Issei's own since he was already incredibly strong without it. He didn't need to rely on the strength of his sacred gear to make big moves or anything. Issei would use his new forces in order to conquer more of Japan and recruit several sacred gear users in hiding along the way. People from South Side would notice how Issei's forces were quickly expanding and even hear his plans of trying to conquer the underworld. They found Issei to be a bit of a madman but also intriguing. Many were already beginning to, were already beginning to to put their lives on, on the line when it came on to combat. As a matter of fact, not even just putting their lives on the line, many were actually already being put to death in combat while trying to evolve their sacred gear as per the request of Sal. So if they switched over to Issei's side now, it wouldn't really make much of a difference at this point if they died. At least it would be while while working with someone who didn't rely on his sacred gear to get results. In their eyes, Issei was becoming the truest symbol of what the hero faction represented. Ten years would pass and Issei had officially become known throughout all of the realms. Realms, his empire was expansive, crossing over several dimensions with several loyal subjects. It wasn't Issei's original goal, but having a criminal empire that basically overthrew the government at this point was better than just being one of the richest people on the planet with a large company he ruled over. This was Issei's ideal reality. One that he lorded over completely. And yeah, that's basically it, Titan Clan. Uh, I would like to thank Neptune for helping me and building up the, prem the premise for this for this remaster remastered version of this what if. Also, another thing is like well of course I have left here a link I've left a link to her Wattpad in the description if you're in, uh, interested in checking out some of her stories. Not only that, but well, I don't know what else to say. Oh yeah, I do have a couple more things to say. Uh, if you liked the video, make sure to hit that like button. If you've been rocking my content for a little while, 
uh, maybe hit that subscribe button, leave a comment, share to others who may be interested in this sort of content as well. Also, since we hit 5k, like I uh, noticed a uh, comment to uh, comment to actually mention how I should also expand my content to another anime as well, Mujoko Tensei. I've already done a what if about now for me uh, being basically part of the dragon race and Mushoko Tensei. And well, they suggested that I do like some videos content as well. So if you guys are interested in that sort of content, let me know and to leave your what if suggestions down in the comments below. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to really say, guys. It is King Kai next signing out. Peace.